Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome back to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast Summer Short Series, where we are getting these super nerdy details on specific subjects all summer long while we gear up for Season 3 of the podcast in October. I don't know about you, but I love a good low-tech, high-production system, and so I reached out to Season 2 guest Howard Allen of Faithful Farms to talk about one he's got going on with his caterpillar tunnel and tomato production um, because it's just awe-inspiring and an excellent use of really small space. So we kind of get into all the details of what the tunnels are, how he did the trellising, the spacing. Um, Super cool conversation. And oh, hey, we are just about $100 from our $2,500 goal at our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash farmer jesse. That's I mean, 50 people chipping in two bucks a month to keep the show growing and allowing us to do more with it. Hopefully it's worth $2 a month for you all. Um, Five, maybe? I don't know. Check it out. There are some perks over there at patreon.com slash farmer jesse. One of those perks being at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Travis and Heidi of Arcadia Acres. Kevin Keen, Ryan Goser, J.M. Fortier, Yannick Laplante, Tony Lopez, Chris Omer, and Clément. Thank you to everyone who supports our show, uh, even if it's just kicking us a couple bucks on Venmo to at no-till growers to say thanks, y'all. Um, we appreciate that. Anyway, patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse or Venmo to at no-till growers. We appreciate all the support. Um, okay, that's my spiel. Let's get into it with one of my favorite growers. Howard Allen of Faithful Farms. Howard Allen, thank you for taking the time in the middle of the season. Uh, I'm super excited to chat with you again. Hey, Farmer Jesse, uh, as, as always, always good to um, talk with you and to you know catch up and see what's happening you know, in the farming world. Yeah. Um, so I've been watching your tunnel tomato production um, via Instagram, and I love that sort of low tech, high production stuff you've got going on. And I thought that would make a great conversation. So um, I thought maybe we could just go through all the pieces and parts of this system, starting with the kind of starting with the tunnels. Maybe um, can you describe those? What size are they? And uh, did they come in a kit, or was that something you manufactured yourself? Yeah, so this is a uh, Farmer's Friends kit. Um, this is the first generation of the Quonset style house um, that they produced um, when they first started making houses. And so we've had this one about three years now. And so it's 14 feet wide by 100 feet long. And uh, we added the middle skeleton to make it a lot more sturdy and stronger. Um, but yeah, it's just a simple tunnel, um, you know. Yeah, is there, okay, so then in terms of uh, trellising, what is holding up the tomatoes on the top end? Yeah. So, well, this year we'll start out by saying that, you know, tomatoes is not one of my favorite things to grow because of all the work that goes into it. So this year I had a crew that was really excited about doing tomatoes. So I just ordered the um, trellising kit from farmers of friends that fit their tunnels. And so, you know, that, you know, took me maybe about half an hour to install uh, really simple um, tech. And from there, um, I had some leftover um, lower and lean um, tomahawks that I purchased from Johnny's a few years ago, which I was using for cucumbers last year. So we decided to use that for our um, indeterminate um, tomato varieties down the two center rows of the house this year. Real quick note here, I neglected to follow up, but the trellis kit from Farmer's Friend looks like a high wire um, that comes with these nifty clips. Um, that you drill into the sides of the bows and then you string the wire through them. Um, that would make sense if you looked at them. Anyway, in the tomahooks, for those who don't know, um, those are basically small spools of string uh, or twine with a hook on each end. So basically you let out a little string and you flip it over and then you rehook it onto the, the trellis wire. Um, so that helps you to lower the, the tomatoes as you go. And that's what we currently actually use. Uh, and they're great. Back to Howard. Nice. So did you get the extension on those kits? Like the height extension? Or are you just going straight from their original? Because I think they sell like a, what, like an 18-inch extent, extension so that it raises up 18 inches? Or are you just going with their standard height? Um, for the um, tunnel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is the standard height. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, this is the first generation kit, you know, so it doesn't have the extra 16-inch um, lift kit. 
Uh, we hope to add that once this plastic wears out, maybe in a year or two, and we have to you know reskin it. We're then gonna um, lift this one. But yeah, but it's uh, old school, so it's it's really low. I think it's about seven and a half feet at the apex. Yeah. Does that is that a problem when you're lowering and leaning? Like we did that one year and it was it was fine, but we felt like yeah. we had to like kind of <laughs> finagle the tomatoes, like basically picking up the cluster and kind of stringing it back over the vines yeah. so it held them off the ground. So, you know, intentions and practicality, you know, oftentimes will line up. And I think in our case this year, that was a case where we decided how to do, you know, lower and lean, but based on how fast the tomatoes were growing, they hit the apex of the house, but then the lower tress of the tomatoes hadn't started to ripen. So we just decided to clip them at the top and just let them um, grow out and just finish ripening up all the fruits. And I mean, per plant, I mean, we're averaging about eight to 10 trusses of fruit, you know, each ranging from maybe, you know, 20 fruit up to 40 fruit, you know, per tress. It's a lot of tomatoes. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So that's kind of what I was wondering. So you're letting it grow all the way up to the apex and then you're clipping the top and you're allowing all the fruit to ripen at once. Are you allowing suckers to keep growing too, or are you just cutting all the, are you removing all those as well? Yeah. So in the first five or six weeks, you know, I mean, we're going through once a week, I'm pruning and then training them to go up, you know, that string. So they are, you know, so they're all single eaters. And at the top, I mean, there are a few that may have, I mean, one or two extra runners, but we're clipping them and we figure each truss of tomatoes will ripen, you know, once, you know, I would say every week. So we probably have another maybe six to seven weeks of tomatoes on those vines, you know, as they continue to ripen out. And, you know, we're additionally planting some more um, determinant varieties that will take us into fall. So I think, I mean, you know, based on the numbers that we're getting now, I mean, we'll have plenty of tomatoes for, you know, for the rest of um, July and August, you know, easily. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so can you take us through some of the varieties that you're growing and doing like that? Yeah, so for the varieties, um, um, for the lower and lean system, we're doing, they're both um, indeterminate. And so we have Sweet 100s, we have Sun Sugars, and then there's another one called a Juliet, which is, looks like a small aroma. Uh, maybe about a two ounce tomato, um, really fleshy, not a lot of seeds. Yeah, so we're using those on the lower lean system. And then for just our just standard, um, I guess you call it maybe the Florida weave, we're doing the BH, I can't remember the number, it's from Johnny's. It's like a three digit number, but it's a really high productive um, tomato um, plant, which has been yielding crazy amounts of tomatoes this year. Yeah, those BHNs are insane. They've really produced a lot of tomatoes. Yeah, so 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 that one is an early tomato. So we started off the season with that one, and we're actually going to transplant another round of that tomorrow, you know, which will take us into October. Um, yeah, so we have another couple of hundred feet to take us into the fall when, you know, most of the tomato, you know, production is dying down. We have a last kind of, you know, kick going into October, into the first frost. Okay, so yeah, I saw that that you're doing you basically have the ones on the high trellis going down those two middle rows and then you have one on the kind of against the wall the, the side bed and that one's on your on a just basic florida weave and yep, those are yep. your sort of shorter yep. varieties yeah and those we prune them you know we started out with a single leader until they were about say 18 inches off the ground and then we let them go wild after that yeah you know so right up to that first so that first cluster of fruit so we did one pruning and that way, you know, you have a nice um, airflow on underneath. Uh, plus, we also had lettuce um, beneath that, too. So it made it really easy to harvest out the lettuce after. And then also, too, for harvesting and just, you know, for overall, um, you know, airflow and um, disease control. And they're going strong. I mean, you know, they they actually grew to about, I would say, maybe seven feet tall total. You know, they kind of went up and kind of flopped over the side and we kind of tied them in. And so, I mean, they've been producing, that row alone produces probably close to 100 pints a week um, on this 100 foot row. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Are you doing, can you talk a little bit about fertilization? Have you, was there anything you different you did for those tomatoes um, to start? And then are you also doing side dressing or anything? Yeah. So, um, so no side dressing. So when we start out, um, we transitioned from our winter crops and then we went into, um, we added some harmony, you know, which is, you know, a basic on fertilizer, you know, um, 
But then in addition to that, we also added some mushroom substrates from a local mushroom grower. And um, we added some um, blood meal, a little bit of feather meal, um, some azomite. So that's usually our mix, you know, that we add in and then we kind of mix it all together and we add it into the soil. But the mushroom substrate was the one thing that we added different that we didn't add in in prior years. And we've been doing that as we flip our beds, you know, this year, we've been adding mushroom substrates. We've been finding that, you know, the soil, you know, with that, you know, high amount of um, fungus, at least when you first start out, really gives the soil like a really big boost um, in terms of, you know, um, the ability to hold moisture. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so for people that may not know, there's, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there's two different things you can get from mushroom people. Like some mushroom growers will compost their uh, mushroom substrate, which is what the mushrooms are grown on. Uh, but then other mushroom producers will just sell like the kind of broken up substrate. That's kind of what you're using, right? It, it's probably like kind of woody, fungally material. Yep. So we got the bags, you know, with, you know, you know, so they probably, you know, had maybe say two harvests off of them, two flushes. And then, you know, they um, throw them out, you know, so we um, get them and then I just break the bags open, you know, so my ceiling is still fresh, still white. And then we break it up into small pieces. Uh, I mean, almost back down to, you know, like a powder. Um, they use um, a, a soybean hull. And so, you know, so that's basically already broken down by the mushroom. So then we just lay about an inch of this on top of the bed. So we come back at another layer of our um, local compost. And then we do a broad fork. And that kind of helps to get the mycelium along with the compost injected into the soil. And we come back with our bed roller, you know, and roll it out and then, you know, we plant. Yeah, that's a cool, that's a cool system. I, I love that you're just reusing yeah. that substrate. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's actually, you know, a second use, you know, think about, you know, a product, you know, that's a byproduct of, you know, the soybean, um, you know, processing. And then that's used for mushrooms. And then again, one time use for the farm going back to the earth. So, yeah, I think that's definitely a good use of it. So can you talk a little bit about some of the inner planting you've done with those tomatoes? Um, yep. Cause you've done, a, you've done some cool ones and I, I want to hear about how those went. Yeah. So lots of, lots of mixed results. So starting out with the BHN varieties, you know, which were shorter varieties, we did lettuce on the, underneath them and we had mixed results. Um, the lettuce grew well. Um, my only drawback and I wasn't thinking this whole thing through, as you can tell, um, is that I used a uh, more cool, um, a cool other variety, you know, we use the, um, a red oak variety and also to a, um, a crunch variety, which are more cool other varieties. And so going forward, I would do this again, but I would use a summer crisp variety. So probably a Muir and or a Cherokee, you know, because, you know, we went from cool weather, you know, when we planted them, but as you know, the season progressed, it got warmer, which was more favorable for the tomatoes, but was less favorable for those cool weather um, lettuce varieties. Um, next, we also did um, basil on the next row on one side, um, 100 plants, basically 12 inches apart. And then on the other side of that, we did 200, um, two feet of um, carrots, um, four inches apart. And so those are coming up really nice now. Um, then down the middle walkway, we kind of took it out and we just put some, um, some onions with the paper pot. And those, I think we should have planted them a little bit deeper. So we lost maybe about half of them and, you know, they're still coming out, you know, okay um, right now. And uh, for the last row, um, we did fennel on both sides. I probably wouldn't do fennel again because, again, that's another cool weather crop. And, you know, as the house got warmer, so probably about half of those bolted. And so we were able to sell, you know, maybe 100 or 200 heads. So it wasn't a total loss, you know, and we were still able, you know, to make some money, you know, from, you know, the crops before we actually got, you know, the main crop, you know, so, you know, so I guess, you know, that's overall maybe a 50-50, you know, result, you know, with with, with a lot of um, promises going down the road. It, fennel is an interesting one because I feel like it has potential, but one of the problems is to keep it cool, you'd have to overhead water it. And then you don't really want to overhead water your, and the same thing goes for lettuce, I guess. Oh, you don't want to overhead water your, your tomatoes, at least not for too long. Right. Um, but yeah. speaking of that, are you... Um, what are you doing for irrigation on those tomatoes? Are you just using drip? Yep, everything is 100% drip, yeah. So when we first laid out our beds and we prepped them, we laid down the drip chase, we turned them on, of course, to make sure everything was uh, um, working properly. 
But then we planted um, one plant per every drip emitter. So that way, you know, we were guaranteed that that plant would get water. So that was, you know, the one little thing that we strategically did that worked out. So all of the basil is still going really strong, um, you know, so. Nice. I want to go back to those tomatoes um, for a minute. What kind yep. of spacing are you, you said you were doing single liter. Um, what kind of spacing are you doing on them? And are you doing the same spacing on the BHN as you are on the cherries and uh, the spice? Yes. So we did um, 12 inches apart. Um, down the center of the bed um, for all of the varieties. So really, so it's 100 plants um, per bed. Okay, and then when you're on those strings, you said that you were stringing them. Are you using clips too, or are you just winding? Well, winding. So we start out with one clip at the bottom just to get it stabilized and just to get the cord, uh, you know, kind of tucked down the bottom. And then after that, we just wind. Nice, that makes it yeah. easy. So it's just less, research. yeah. Yeah, it makes it easier. It's less resources. Plus, also at the end, it just you know one less thing that you have to you know um, throw into you know the burn pile. I love that idea of using. Also, just thinking about this, bouncing around a little bit, but thinking about the idea of using that pathway. Like you said, you put onions in there. Um, yeah, we've been experimenting a little bit with that ourselves, and and I feel yeah. like there's potential. Um, have you had success with other crops in that space? Yeah, so we've had, um, in, in terms of, like, like I'm using um, walkways. Yeah. Yeah, so we've had um, success, for example, in our house next door to that. We did some um, some green onions um, the same way, but we planted them a little bit deeper, and that seemed to work out much better. Uh, plus, also, to prior to transplanting them, we also kind of trimmed the tops. I saw another farmer did that. I think it was Spring Hills out of Canada. I think we saw them trim the top of their onions, and they seemed to be bulking up a lot better. Um, you know, then when we just transplant them regular, so don't have to have any, you know, impact on the yield. Interesting. So there, what are you using something special? Are you just using like scissors? Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, I mean, just a um, scissors to give them like a nice haircut, you know, while they're in the tray. Yeah. Yeah. We've yep. done that with yeah. bulb onions. I've never thought to do it with, with like spring onions. Um, yeah. That's pretty smart. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm just trying, you know, those things that I've seen, you know, that other people have found some success with and see, you know, if they work in my context. Um, you know, but, you know, mainly this year, you know, I mean, we've been doing a lot of experiments, um, you know, so, you know, so, you know, so we have, you know, our niche, you know, greens, but then, you know, we're trying to do things, especially year round to see how far we can push them into, you know, the shoulder seasons, you know, you know, things like celery and beets, you know, which we've, you know, growing, I mean, really well into summer here, you know, right now, you know, um, so, you know, and, you know, those are the crops that are really, you know, challenging to grow, especially when it gets really hot. Yeah. Can I ask you how COVID has changed what you plan to grow or how you're growing at all? Yeah, well, I mean, COVID's really, um, I would say it has been a challenge as a, as for me and all the farmers to really, you know, maximize our production. I would say to think smarter in terms of how we farm, um, maximize the space that we already have versus trying to, you know, acquire more space you know, to meet, you know, the growing demands, you know. So, I mean, COVID has really, I mean, put a lot of pressure on, on I mean, on small farmers. Um, but also, too, I think it's an opportunity for us to at least try to, you know, double our footprint in the space, you know, to get to that, you know, five, six, six percent, you know, um, you know, market share where, you know, we potentially can make some difference, you know, in the food system. Yeah, so take me back to when COVID came in. Like, did you see your interest, interest in your produce kind of jump pretty fast? Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it was, I mean, really fast. Um, you know, I think in our area, I mean, there's always been a demand, you know, for local foods. So that demand has really increased, um, you know, especially from the population who probably, you know, wasn't as much into local food, but now seeing that, you know, their local food supply was on the threat, you know, and, you know, the big chain supply, you know, was really, you know, showing gaps so um so lots of demands um more demands from aggregators you know there are you know aggregators that weren't around you know four months ago who are here now and you know may have boxes you know on a bi-weekly basis of say maybe 200 and are looking you know you know for supplies for their boxes so again that's more opportunity you know while you know there's the local grocers you know who want local stuff and will buy yours you know instead of you know you know the guys who are in florida or you know wherever they're aggregating from so Again, you know, that demand has just steadily grown. 
and going into fall, you know, with, you know, more, you know, grant money coming in, you know, from all the different, um, you know, legislations, you know, uh, from our government, but there's lots of money and people, again, looking for food, whether it's from food banks, um, you know, people open in farmer's markets. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, just increased demand. And I think that demand will continue to grow. And, you know, my concern is that as we get into fall and going into winter, you know, when, you know, I would say half of the local grows are not growing on the cover. And, you know, if they are, you know, then, you know, what percentage of the operation is. So again, the demand would only increase for more local as the supply of local will dwindle in the fall going into winter. So lots of changes. Yeah. Did you, um, yeah, for sure. It's been a wild few months. Um, in yeah. terms of remind us what your marketing outlets are and did any of that, you, you mentioned some other, you mentioned some, you know, some new opportunities, but did any, did you have to change anything? So I didn't have to do a lot of change. I mean, we're very fortunate here um, in Carborough and Chapel Hill area where our markets never closed. I mean, like some areas, you know, I mean, we have a very um, progressive town and, you know, people who, I mean, it's really work hard together with the community, you know, to keep their markets open and to really put in early, you know, those social space and, um, you know, cues that has made things a lot easier, you know, so we were either, you know, in step or ahead of, you know, of the game and we're able to keep things open. So that was a big thing for us, uh, for our markets, because all, you know, the restaurant sales went dead and fortunately for us, our, our um, revenues from restaurants were maybe only about 5%. And, but then we adapted to um, online which rapidly grew to about right now at about maybe say 30% of our sales. And so we've just continued with uh, farmers markets and now we're focusing more on supplying local aggregators and just to that, um, diversify, you know, our um, income stream. So as you know, this, as we transition, whether it's into another wave of the pandemic, you know, um, for this fall going into winter or not, but just to diversify our streams of income. So going forward into the future, um, you know, we'll just be just a more solid farm. Um, we're also working with a local, um, co-op, you know, to supply them with some items and hopefully into the fall, we'll get maybe two items in there, but you know, but that's a long-term proposition. So we're taking that one slow. Um, so overall, you know, just trying our best to adapt to change. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, a lot of that going on right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to be flexible, right? You have to be water. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, well, Howard Allen, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time and, uh, chatting with me. Hey, man, thanks a lot. Man. As always, it's a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, we love the work you do and continue, you know, to do you know, all the great work in um, no-till and bring us great information. You know, thanks a lot for the whole team. Absolutely, man. Yeah, always a pleasure. All right. If you enjoyed that conversation, make sure to follow Howard on Instagram and all the places at Faithful Farms. We will hook it up with links in the show notes. Also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're getting it and rate and review it and share it and talk about it in chat rooms, buy it a drink. It prefers lagers, though it will get down with a nice sour from time to time. Um, it's good to know those things. Huge thanks to Jackson and Jordan Roulette for their work on getting the hats out and all the other stuff. Thanks to Josh Satin for getting Growers Live back up and running um, and for banking some awesome video material for you all this fall um, while we do the podcast. Thanks to Hannah Crabtree, my wife, for everything. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.